Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today well it's an unusual one we're gonna paint a cake uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get to the technique in Learned Vinci V. So, I participate in Warhammer tournaments. That's often why I paint a lot, but not all of my figures. And a thing you have to do when you take your army to a Warhammer tournament is have a display board. I generally like to compete for best painted. Oftentimes your display board is factored into that, though not always. And you just have to have a good display. The problem with that is that I don't play the same army year to year. I like painting armies. I don't like the huge, ridiculous craft project that is making new display boards. Now, I've made plenty of videos on it, so you can see that I've done it plenty of times. I try to just give those away or something like that because once I'm done with the tournament or done with the year of bringing it to tournaments, what am I going to do with this thing? It's just some giant two by two foot thing. I can peel a couple pieces off and use it for terrain, maybe. But for the most part, it's just something that takes up space in my house and annoys me and I don't like it. So, the question becomes, how do we solve that? Well, I wanted to take Slanesh to a tournament. I've built Slanesh display boards in the past. I did not want to build another one. And then I was surfing around on Twitter and saw somebody had a little fun lava cake and they had displayed Lego minifigs on there. Obi-Wan and Anakin. The whole, it's over Anakin, I have the high ground. Lava, cake, get it? It's a funny joke. And I thought about that joke, and it occurred to me, wait a minute, I'm playing Slanesh. An army of excess and delights and temptation. And so, a plan was born. I went out to uh, the local uh, Gordon Food Services, it's like a restaurant supplier, and I picked up two frozen uh, red velvet cakes. Took them home, put them in my deep freezer until the day before the tournament. Uh, well, for that day. I bought them the day before the tournament, so for that day. Got them out that night and decided to paint them. So I'm going to take you through how I painted a cake, which was an unusual thing. I hope you'll join me for this. This is a very unusual journey, but it will teach you a lot about your airbrush and airbrushing in unusual circumstances. So I hope you stick with me and see something fun and different. Now, before you ask, yes, these are edible airbrush paints. So I special ordered some edible airbrush paints. You can get them online. It's pretty cool. I'll link them down below in case you want to do this yourself. I cleaned out my airbrush thoroughly before I started so there would be no paint in it. And then we set about. Now, an interesting part about this uh, and this whole project is that we have to work in a different way. Normally with our figures, if we spray something and we make it dark and then we want to make it light, we can just get out white paint or something that's bright and brighten the area. However, this will be much more like working over a, or working with pencil, actually, kind of. Um, or, or maybe like spray paint without a white can. I don't know. Because I don't have any ability throughout this project to go lighter. I cannot go lighter. The reason I can't go lighter is because as I apply paint to the white frosting, these are red velvet cakes, by the way, which of course, again, blood red, slin ash, you get it. Anyways, the reason I had to, I can only go darker is because I'm going to keep applying colors. There's no white in the airbrush paint. It doesn't exist. Uh, not for, not for these thin transparent paints for the top of cakes. So I have to work from my lightest color to my darkest color and make sure that I'm working from the back of the piece forward, effectively. Uh, the piece I decided to attempt to paint here is the Prison of Slanesh, uh, which is a very fun piece. I like it. I've done a couple different versions of it in, in before and in other things, like it's the center of my uh, fane of Slanesh and so on. And uh, so I kind of, the first thing I needed to do was cut out some stencils. So I got myself some plastic card, washed it off, and then cut some simple columns because I need those areas for those columns to stay relatively white and bright for my later work. I then lay those on the cake along with a little circle plastic top void to have a void in the center of Slanesh's heart. And, uh, and then we go to work. Now I begin by laying down some very light blues all around the sides of the piece to kind of, because I'm going to want to frame basically the, the dark void of Slanesh in the middle, then relatively light colors around uh, the Slanesh sort of shadow, and then dark colors on the edge. So we have this nice light, dark, light progression, just like the original piece. So I begin, what's fun about this is it really is just very freeing. I can like work a bunch of different colors because they're so thin and so transparent that I have the ability to 
uh, just constantly be integrating in colors. So I work my way through different blues, fuchsias, purples, all those kinds of things, sort of darkening out the areas around the edge and creating that movement uh, towards the, the the shadow at the edge of the um, at the edge of the cake. Uh, once that's done, it's time to lay in some darker areas. So I take more of a dark purple, mix it with a little black, and I start laying in things like the rocks underneath the pillars, because like each of the pillars is like floating on some uh, magically you know raised piece of stone. So I kind of lay those down. Um, whenever I'm spraying near the um, my masks, by the way, I do kind of just touch them and push down on them to make sure that I'm not because the spray will go underneath pretty easily. But the cake itself, the frosting, has a little stick to it. So if I just put light pressure, it'll they'll stick right to it and no problem at all. Um, then it's time to start forming slanesh, basically. So that's when I move to black because it needs to be this inky black void in the middle. And I just start roughing in the shape. Now, when I'm working here, the important part to understand is that you want to work thin and then out. Because again, I can't really erase things. Um, I can only, like, uh, I can't really erase things. I can only, uh, tighten them or slightly color shift them or stuff like that. So I work from the center of sort of the slanesh void out, shaping it, like, start with the arms, making them very thin, and then build to the full claws. Start with the torso, making it very thin, and then build to the full shape. Start with the head, and then slowly build up and out with the horns and things like that, right? So as I'm building this, I'm building... Now, I don't try to draw the outline of the shape. I start with a center and then fill it, fill it, fill it until it roughly looks correct. This is generally a good piece of advice for freehand of all kinds as you're working on it. Don't I see a lot of people with freehand try to do the outside of the shape first. That's never right. You start with the inside of the shape, build your way out. So um, once the nesh is like roughly blocked in and I've got those dark pieces down, then I can remove my masks and start to go to work. Now, uh, here, what I'm going to do is just basically I need to create the three dimensionality to the pillars. So, you know, I just kind of basically freehand on a line down one side where it's uh, to create that the, the sort of, yeah, the three dimensionality of it to create a shadow side and a bright side. Not that complicated. Um, it does mean I have to kind of freehand straightly. And when you're working with your airbrush and you want precision, this is something you'll see airbrush artists do a lot. You notice I grip my my other hand with my hand. And so I'm pulling with the airbrush and I'm, I'm holding it with two hands effectively. Like my left hand is holding my right hand, which is holding the airbrush. That helps create additional stability to help you do very thin, precise lines with your airbrush. You'll see a lot of professional airbrush artists when they're working on canvas or walls or any, anything like that, that they have absolutely both hands locked and gripped there and they're working like very close in that way. Um, once I've laid down the sort of three-dimensional sides of the pillars, I just I start with like a light pink and then just work in deeper colors. And that's another piece of advice. When you're working on this kind of a layering method where you can't go backwards, you want to build up slowly. So you start with your lighter colors and then we just, you can get very expressive. I took some blues and worked it into the shadow side. I took some purples and worked it into the shadow side, right? Kind of tilting that more pink color into a more natural maroon shadow and then deepening those shadows below that. So just kind of building that out. Then we get to a really fun part. Um, I also, by the way, lay in some pink and stuff in the heart in the same way once that uh, mask is done. Uh, just making sure that that's all kind of in there and ready to go. Now, <clears throat> once uh, I've got kind of all of that in place, right, uh, My, I, I realize that there is a way that I can actually subtract and go back to white. Not in any big way, but in a minor way. If you've ever seen spray paint artists work, where they'll like spray the spray paint while it's still wet, they'll scratch at it or pull it up or stuff like that, I realized I could do the same here. So I had uh, basically chopsticks, right, from just like Chinese food, and I can use that to then draw and trace in the frosting. And you'll notice I draw and then kind of wipe the thing on a paper towel and then draw and wipe and draw and wipe. That's because I'm actually like wiping the extra frosting off. And I can do things like trace outlines around things and make back the um, 
you know, kind of bring back the original white line. So anytime I need to then color change something, so for example, on like the rocks to create more three dimensionality to them, I can like scrape like rock shapes into them. I can trace the outer edge of the pillars. I can create a swirl in the, the heart of Slanesh to then lay a lighter color over that to show that there's like actually some kind of torrent. Um, but in all those cases, what I can do is I can scratch some of the frosting away and then apply a new lighter color and create that then depth. So I did that until I uh, was relatively happy with all of the sort of edge lines and everything like that and, uh, you know, came away. My last steps were just some finishing out, adding a little more color to the body of Slanesh, hitting it with some blues, some purples to add some like shifting, uh, chaotic maelstrom and, and colors happening in the body so it wasn't just flat black um and then like still darkening some of the edges of the cake and things like that to make sure we really had that full thing one of the last things i did was then etch the chains into it there's chains in the image that connect uh slanesh to the the pillars that hold them in place and so i i just use the chopsticks to quickly etch a chain shape which is really easy it's just like a u and then a u in the middle of that other u to connect them uh, out of the thing and then did a light uh, spray paint of like or, or light paint of uh, basically some yellow to give them a little bit of like magical energy. I started just doing a real real quick bursts in the the the, the chain to make a few intense spots of energy and then just kind of did a, a wide pass over everything to give a general light yellow enter magical you know elven energy tone to the whole thing. Once those chains were in place and, you know, the, the uh, edges are all colored, it's all done. There you go. Um, this was a lot of fun. Here's what my army looked like set up on it, ironically covering up most of my good work, um, which is funny. Um, but, oh well, you know, that's fine. I, I, it was still good. Um, the tournament, it was very well received at the tournament. Um, after for the first round, I set it up, set up my army, and then... Uh, as people would turn in their results, I would uh, I asked if I could tempt them with a piece of my display board. And I cut the cake and uh, gave everyone some red velvet cake. And so everybody had a little treat after round one, courtesy of Slanesh. And uh, I did manage to have people ate most of both cakes. I only had about uh, a little less than half of one left before people were just, that was it. People were kind of sick of cake and everybody who wanted some got some. But that's fine. Um, I also added some macaroons to it just as extra little, you know, kind of visual interest and thought it was fun. I ended up using the macaroons during the uh, games as well. Whenever I gave my opponents dice, I would give them a macaroon also. This was a really fun and unusual project. Um, and it showed me how much I have to learn. Like, don't try to paint directly once the cake is frozen. It makes the paint beat up as the, as the frozen cake becomes naturally moist because it's de-thawing. That was causing a little bit of issues, but it wasn't too bad. Um, I would have probably, I probably should have the cake thawed and, and dry and then paint. Um, I'm sure it would have been better if I was using like fondant or something like that, but, or fondant, I don't know how you say it. But anyways, the, it like, it taught me a lot and it was fun to push myself on airbrushing, something I do a lot, in an unusual way. Um, it made me think really deeply about each step and what I was doing and how I placed my colors. And because it made me use those skills in an orthogonal way to how I would normally apply them, I felt like I really grew and learned a lot from the experience for both my for using my airbrushing with normal figures as well. So it was a great experience. People liked the cake. If you ever want to decorate something, maybe you could try this, um, you know, impress your partner. Or maybe if you have kids and you want to do a cool decoration for their birthday, um, this is a great thing to do. It's a lot of fun. Put your mini fig painting skills to use for your family, I guess. Uh, you know, surprise your wife or your child or your, uh, your husband with a, a painted cake that is, is something cool. You can do it. Um, you just need to make sure your airbrush is clean and you've got uh, some edible paint and you're good to go. Like I said, I'll put the link for that down below so you can check it out if you want. Um, but if you've got any questions about what I did here, you can feel free to drop them down below. Don't worry, this isn't going to become like a painting cakes channel or anything. Uh, this is just a sort of one-off and I wanted to share with all of you because I thought you'd enjoy it and enjoy coming along on this journey with me. If you liked this, give it a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating. We have new videos here every Saturday and they are very rarely about cakes. 
If you want to support the channel, lots of ways you can do so. You can look down below. There's affiliate links to pick up everything, such as the aforementioned edible paint. Uh, that doesn't cost you anything extra. In fact, it often saves you money and uh, it helps give the channel a kickback. It's a great thing to do uh, that really helps support the channel. Um, there's also the games I make with Uncle Adam down there. And of course, there's our Patreon focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. As always, though, I thank you so much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time.